The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. I'm Patrick, Head of Technology at professional services firm Collins SBA. I'm a former financial advisor who just loves solving business problems and creating better client experiences using technology. Join me each week as we unpack the tech on offer to advise professionals, stay on top of tech trends, and help you break free from the analysis paralysis experience when building and maintaining a great tech stack. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where your clients have the best wealth technology at their fingers. With NetWealth's next-gen client portal and mobile app, clients can view and manage their portfolio, assets, and accounts wherever they are. By adding external bank and property feeds to their NetWealth account, they can get a true picture of their wealth. And by giving them the ability to transact and manage their cash, they can feel in control of their wealth. A world of client engagement awaits. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Today, we're talking business transformation with Martin Cooperwaite, co-founder at Kyandra, a software development firm with a strong focus on using low-code and visual tools to build solutions. So tools like OutSystems, Microsoft Power Platform, and recent guest on the show, Wakado. What I find quite remarkable about Kyandra is they demonstrate skin in the game through their working prototype initiative, where you engage them to build your business a free working prototype before moving forward. And what they do build has a 24-month warranty, and it's built in a way that you don't need to rely on Kyandra for updates or changes. I started by asking Martin what the oldest piece of tech he still owns is and whether he still uses it. Okay, so uh, the oldest piece of tech for me has to be a 1980, and that is the actual year. It's a, <laughs> it was called a Dick Smith System 80. So um, for the really old ancient nerds in the audience, they might have remembered a computer called a TRS-80. Well, Dick Smith basically put his face on it and called it the Dick Smith System 80, but it's the same thing. And this thing was a uh, an immense computer of uh, incredible performance. It had a whopping 48 kilobytes of RAM and no disks at all. It had a tape drive. And the uh, the crazy thing about it is that it was made with fake wood paneling. So if yeah. you think about today, that would be the last thing that you were trying to sort of associate with a computer design. Yeah. But back then, it was uh, all about being classy. And uh, I think everything in the in that time, at least at the end of the 70s, was all about, um, you know, wood paneling. And so it got on the computer as well. And the reason I had that is that my dad was so inspired by Dick Smith in the eighties. So he had to. Everything was about Dick Smith. He he <laughs> he, he he loved it. the fact that Dick Smith had a um, he, he solo travelled around the world in a helicopter. Uh, it was a Bell Jet Ranger, and my dad was so um, so impressed by that. He uh, he actually made radio controlled flying models of the exact same helicopter, and he actually no won way. some competitions for that. But then, of course, not only did he have to have the helicopter, but he had to buy his computer. So, uh, I, uh, we, in our house, we assumed that dad would probably, you know, ask to erect a shrine to uh, <laughs> Dick Smith, but, uh, thank goodness that didn't happen. But, um, so yes, we had the, that Dick Smith system AD computer, uh, where it would take, sorry, one last point, it would take about half an hour to 45 minutes to load software off the oh, tape man. drive. And you'd just sit there and sometimes it would get an error and fail and you'd have to start again. But anyway, uh, I think you were saying before, you know, do we still, do I still use it? Uh, and um, no, uh, no, it's not in use. And I don't even know if it would fire up, but now you've got me intrigued and I want to, uh, I want to see if I can turn it on. So, yeah. Um, I was going to say, if you, if you turn it on now, you might know in sort of once this podcast recording's finished, whether it's um, loaded up or not. But is yeah, that true. like... <laughs> Is it was it the early eighties where sort of home or personal computers became like more like accessible and more popular and sort of Dick Smith was maybe a pioneer of that in terms of like competing on price but also like quality? Yeah, I think um I would argue that really it was the Commodore sixty four that was the 
There was the VIC-20 and then there was the Commodore 64 a little bit later in the 80s. I think it was mid-80s. I can't actually remember. Yeah. I didn't actually have one. Um, but uh, it, uh, that, I would say, would have been the um, really the explosion of the home computer. I yeah. think the um, this old System 80 and the TRS-80 was a bit prior to that. It was a bit crap. It had like 127 <laughs> pixels across the top and 48 pixels down vertically, if you think about that as a grid of the pixels, whereas, you know, what we're using now is um, full HD and things, so, uh, yeah. and, and 4K. So, um, yeah, the graphics were awful, uh, really like Lego bricks. So, yeah, I would say the Commodore 64 really is where it took off. So, yeah, no, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. And then, I mean, in terms of what they actually look like, you mentioned the wood panelling, like a real sort of terminal-style computer, am I right? Yeah, so you would use a television, an old TV as your uh, as your monitor. Oh, right, and, okay. Uh, so it would plug in through an aerial connection. And then the computer itself was like a, if you think of a massive keyboard, a massive keyboard which would be about, oh, say... 80 centimetres wide um, <laughs> and maybe 60 centimetres deep. And uh, and then the tape drive is sort of embedded. And when I say tape, I mean like cassette tapes. You know, you the ones you used to do your mixed tapes on that you would prepare all the greatest hits of Guns N' Roses and the rest back in the 80s. Yeah. Well, uh, they're the same sort of tapes that were used in this device as well, just with a sort of a tape deck with the buttons at the front. You actually had to hit record if you were writing software and hit the play button on the tape deck yeah, wow. as well. As, yeah, That's unheard of. So I guess oh, fast forwarding, excuse the pun, sort of 40 plus years. Um, the next question is, is always around AI and normally I'd go for one or two ways that you're using it, either person or your business. But as many as you can, Martin, how are you using AI in your business? Okay, so in the business as opposed to perhaps – what we might do for other clients. But yeah. if I say what I'm using in the business, look, absolutely chat GBT to help edit and in, in, in improve ideate. It's just amazing what it can do. It really is your super smart helper. And uh, as long as you're, um, we're very conscious about only putting non-sensitive information into it, yeah. uh, but there is still an enormous scope to get such benefit there. And I think in particular with GT. Um, GPT-4, the creativity, I mean, for example, just things like the other week I had to give a an update to the company and Taylor Swift had just um, released her new album. Yeah. And so I asked, I said, look, here's my update that I prepared. Um, once again, there was nothing in there particularly sensitive. Well, nothing there was sensitive at all, should I say. Uh, it was more generic updates. And I said, please rewrite this um, in a comedic manner uh, you, you know, referencing Taylor Swift's new album and 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 her, you know, her discography legacy, and it did an amazing job. And I got all these yeah. pats on the back, and they're saying that was hilarious. And I'm like, can't take any credit. So anyway, so ChatGPT is is just a fantastic tool for improving anything written. Uh, I say I, I just use it all the time. Um, the other one is for us because we we build software. And we, in particular, build software now primarily using low-code technology. Low-code technology has improved to such an extent that AI is now deeply embedded in those platforms. And so what we're doing is AI assists you every step of the way with how you are building software for your clients. And it, it's like making suggestions. It, it's it's learned off, um, say, a thousand best practice implementations within a given industry context. And yep. then- because you're building business software, even though there's lots of aspects that you might implement that are unique to your business, in a lot of the way, the core of what the structure of these applications across the business domain, there's a lot of similarity. And so mm -hmm. really, this assistance that you get from these AI tools embedded in those platforms um, is, you know, is amazing. Like you can understand the context of what you're doing. It can suggest, ah, you're doing this. Do you think you should... Um, like, for example, if you're building something to manage users, it will say, right, well, do you want to implement role-based security? Yes. Okay, bang, it does it for you. Then you you spend more time just tweaking what the AI helped create and less time building things from the ground up. And that really is that shift now. It's about leveraging AI, it providing ideas and helping implement, and then you 
just adjust those ideas as opposed to continuously now having to build it all from the ground up. Um, and it can help make smart decisions and really help you, you know, keep it fast paced because one of the key drivers nowadays, especially for when you're building software, is projects in the past that, you know, might have to might have taken 12 months. That's just unacceptable now. And so yeah. we're really looking at delivering it in six months or four months. And so when you're making people work quickly and there's so many human aspects, AI can help make the smart decisions there. Um, other ways, uh, you know, co-pilot for transcripts is huge for us in meetings. Yeah. Um, the other one too is, once again, even though you might be building software with these tools, there's still aspects of where you have to, for example, define and describe the uh, the requirements. And that's often done in a form of what you call a user story. And so uh, AI can help generate those user stories um, very rapidly. And likewise, when you've built something and you want to test whether it's working correctly against what you need it to do, then you create something called acceptance criteria. Mm -hmm. um, that means like, and then AI can help generate the acceptance criteria too based on the user story that it helped generate too. So really what it just means is you're spending so much less time generating text in whatever form. AI can help create a lot of that and you're spending more time perhaps just editing and tweaking. Um, yeah, they're probably the main the main areas, I would say, uh, at this stage. That's amazing. Look, I, I really resonate and, and I'm really excited by that you know, user acceptance um, example there. Like being able to say, does this hit the brief that we promised? You know, we're talking about sort of 12 months becoming four months or three months, but it's still a long time if you think about four months ago. Like it can get very easy to, uh, if you're just thinking about it, even just a project internally where – what comes out the end is a lot different to what was originally asked for, what the original pain points are. So I think that makes a lot of sense. And like even even this just this week we've got OpenAI announcing GPT 4.0. So now if anyone hasn't seen that update or is unfamiliar, basically turning your um, or bringing AI into giving it vision capability. So essentially opening up the, the camera on your phone or your device and it's reading and, and viewing essentially live video and now responding as well in a really natural way. Like do you see, I mean, in terms of that coming to fruition, do you think you're going to embed something like that maybe this year in terms of the speed of development for AI, maybe starting internally but then rolling out to clients or businesses? Oh, yeah. No, we'll be starting right away like like as, as soon as we can. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's just it looks awesome. I mean, we um, – we, we have a project that we built that um, incorporates handwriting and yeah. this will be an awesome augmentation of that. Um, yeah, it just looks awesome. And yeah, they've only just, uh, they've only just released it. So um, we've yeah. got, uh, we've got a team who's jumped straight on it now, but uh, yeah, I think um, obviously that um, AI assistance and getting feedback and reviewing visual data and things is all just going to, it's just like an order of magnitude going to improve the aspects that I spoke about before about, you know, currently just using it to help you with text ideas and other bits and pieces. But I think, yeah, the um, the visual formats and in particular the handwriting aspects because mm. handwriting still plays a key role in like digital handwriting still a key role in a lot of how our clients work um, yeah. and that'll be huge. That'll be huge as in – and the way – I don't know if you saw the example where it had like yeah. people's mathematical formula and it's like, yeah, that's right and you've done it correct. That's just amazing. I just – I just can't get over how fast and how exciting this. Um, a bit scary too. <laughs> oh, this, uh, the, the industry is going. Uh, I would never have guessed it if you'd asked me this a couple of years ago. Oh no, I'm with you. And yeah, I watched a few demos yesterday as well, and it was, I think, acting as like a real time translator for two people. I think it was someone speaking Italian and English, and then straight into you know it helping a father and son with trigonometry homework, but then acting. Yeah. Like more like a, like a guide or an actual tutor or teacher rather than actually just saying this is the answer. So actually trying to help that student with the homework. And yeah, responding like in a really quick and natural way to the point where like you have the, the person operating the, the AI literally just interjecting when it wants to change the subject or just go, yeah, we've got enough information, what's next? So, but yeah, responding like quicker than it takes for, you know, a record to process when you hit save in Salesforce, for example. Like it's just crazy how much sort of processing power it has. Um, yeah. But anyway, yeah, in, terms right. of, in terms of um, 
today, it really is a, a special on on business transformation. And that is, um, I don't think there's anyone better than, than someone like yourself to sort of take us through that and discuss it. So, Kai Andra, can you take us through the, the origin story? I know you've been in business for 30 plus years. So, how it came to be and how you help businesses today? Yeah. So, um, all right. So, it all started for me at least when I was around, I think it was about six years old and it, what my dad used to, uh, we used to trot down to the, um, the, the store. What was it called? I think it was Radio Shack was the name of it. Okay. Uh, yeah. and, uh, they would used to buy on these stands. You could buy, uh, source code and it would be like, um, there's this cool game. It's called Meteor Mission. And, uh, you had to, you know, rescue these astronauts that were stranded and they were being bombarded by meteors and um for the TRS-80 and and uh but you weren't buying uh a tape because that's what this computer took you bought the source code which you would then take home and over a period of uh well weeks or months you would type it in and and uh eventually you would get a game and so my dad used to give that for me to do and when you're six you don't really question it you just your whole world is as your parents sort of create for you and I loved it and and I I did an awful job like an awful job I obviously had probably more typos than correct code but slowly plugging away I'd eventually get the game in there and it would take me a long long time but I would get there and then I really got this awesome sense of accomplishment then that led to me getting a real um have a real excitement about the concept of writing software and the creativity that could be applied to it and then so by the time I was at grade two and grade three I was writing my own ver- games very simple ones like adventure yeah. games and then I would um, be installed them on the on the school computers and uh, so you'd have like a computer room back in those days and at that stage they were Commodore 64s and I would have you know I'd write a game and install it on there and the kids would be playing my little game as opposed to uh, doing the school work and so I had a kind of a a love hate relationship with the uh, the computer teacher, <laughs> and you know all the other kids were out playing sport, but nerdy Marty was uh, was writing games on the school's computers. And then um, you know anyway, so that that um, aspect of really of, of of loving of computers and software um, led to me in high school doing everything and anything in relating to PCs. You see, so by the time I'm in high school, PCs had really sort of arrived on the scene. Um, and I was fixing my own computer, fixing friends' computers, and I had a mate called mate Cam Cameron Brooks, and he uh, he and I were at school together. And uh, uh, Cam also had uh, a um, an affinity with computers and a passion for them, but he also also was able to maintain uh, to be good at sport as opposed to myself. But uh, he, um, you know, we both finished school and um, we're, we're doing our own little things on the side in relation to just fixing computers and things. And then um, come university time, Cam sort of thought, was thinking to himself, well, who's the nerdiest kid I know? Well, it's Marty. And what had happened was Cam's uncle had reached out to him and said, look, we've got this accounting business in um, uh, in Surrey Hills in Melbourne and, uh, you know, they need to implement you know what they want three new computers and they want them to share files and print to a shared printer and things and um you know and he hadn't done anything like that before and to be honest either had I but um he contacted me because as I said I was the nerdiest kid he knew and he's like oh um do you reckon we could try and do this one together um and I'm like yeah that sounds awesome and so we did and somehow we you know we pulled it off and uh, and it worked and uh you know and then we um and then they told another business and then we did another one and did another one. And so anyway, and then we got to this point where we were like, okay, we really need a name now. We probably should create a business, like do this properly. Because at this stage, we were just a couple of kids doing work within this, you know, these accounting businesses. And um, at the time we were, you know, we, we we had the most boring name that we were thinking that we would use. And it was like, oh, we want to call ourselves System Solutions. So off we went to the... Uh, the, to 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 register the business name, and I couldn't can't remember the name of the place where you used to register them. But let's just say the place where you registered business names. I remember back then it was like seventy dollars, and um, I went in there and 
there was a uh, like an old green screen computer, and this was the early nineties. And uh, I typed in system solutions, and the green computer, green screen computer, said, "Yep, that's okay." And then I got in the queue, and at this stage, I remember I was uh, running late for an exam, and uh, I got to the front of the line, and I'm quite stressed about this exam, and and uh, there was this lady uh, behind the counter, um, very intimidating woman, smoking a cigarette, and she's like, "You can't have system solutions; it's too similar to these other names." And I was like, thrown. You know, the computer had said it was okay, and I've got this this woman who clearly wants me to hurry up, and I want to hurry up too, and I and I was sort of froze. And she looked at me, and she said, well, what's the name of your street that you live on? And I said, oh, it's Kyandra. And she goes, that'll do, bang, bang, done, and didn't even ask me if I was okay <laughs> with it. <laughs> and so Kyandra System Solutions was born, and then, um, you know, subsequently we sort of realized how daggy the system solutions part was and i apologize to anyone else who's actually got a business with that name and sorry no offense but for us we <laughs> thought it was pretty daggy and so we just went with kyandra and w- what we found by that stage is that other businesses had names like data this or tech that and it was a little bit different um obviously if you today um there are so many awesome cool different names especially in the digital agency space but uh Back then, everything was data tech or core business that. So, yeah, for us, we were a bit different being Kyandra. Um, one little interesting extra point is that we found out a little bit later that – so it was Kyandra Close that I grew up on, and that's obviously where Kyandra yeah. came from. Now, we um, we had learned that uh, yeah, in, in one Aboriginal language, because it's a, it's a – I believe, and please, if, 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 I, if I'm incorrect, I do apologize, but for what I had we had been told – that in one Aboriginal language, it meant my little home. And, you know, we looked at them, we go, oh, that's so lovely. It would, it's great to find that out. Not that it was a driver at the time for us to name the business that yeah. once again, it was the, it was the smoking lady. But, um, the, uh, <laughs> but we were like, wow, that's really nice. There's, we, we knew that there was Kyandra, which is a town in New South Wales. And there's also Kyandra Nursing Home, which I believe, I don't think it actually is in New South Wales. So once again, the my little home thing. It aligns really nice. But then we found out later that in a different Aboriginal language, it meant sharp stone used for killing. And we were like, uh oh. <laughs> and so, but by that stage, Kyandra, we had, you know, we had sort of lots of clients who were going for quite a few years. So we just sort of left the name as it is. So, yes. So, as you say, I, I have been doing this for over 30 years. The, the, the Kyandra went from a business to a proper company in 1995. So the company's what, roughly 29 years old. Yep. And it feels so strange to me now. I mean, I feel the same as I did at 25, but I just turned 50 last month. So, yep. yeah, it's such a weird, weird feeling. Um, and doing kind of the same thing for so long, I don't know if that's good or bad, but, uh, um, yeah, it's certainly been interesting, right? No, I, th- I think you're one of the few people that knew what they wanted to do when they were young and then actually followed through with it. Like I think it's really, really cool and I love that origin story of how the name came to be. Do you mind sort of taking us through how you help businesses today in 2024? Yeah, so Coriandra um, now today builds um, – we do sort of software development activity but we're leveraging yeah. – we don't build software the same way as, as the way it used to be done. Uh, yeah. I mean we do – we do uh, – in the use of use cases where it's required, but more and more so now the industry has really transformed. And so, yes, we're doing sort of typically significant um, transformation projects and it's where an organisation has really decided that they want to really differentiate, um, take a leap forward and be really unique. And yep. usually it's in an area where... Um, most of the others that they compete, like they would compete with, are all using the same software tools and much yep. the same way, and they've really had the courage to do something different. And for them, it's really about driving a a, a much greater ROI and much more growth, you know, or, or dramatic efficiency gains that usually is the the spark, or a whole new initiative such as a startup initiative. Now, it doesn't need to be your normal cliched startup where it's a couple of people in a garage with an idea. It can actually be a large organization who wants to start a new initiative and they want to run it with a sort of startup mindset and then they'll get us to uh, help with that too. Yeah, brilliant. So it it really is 
um, about those businesses that want to, like as you mentioned, probably in in an industry where the rails or the tech is very similar and usually the standard offering is the same, but they want to stand out, they want to take it to the next level. No, that's really cool. I mean, just on that, do you have any projects that you're really proud of or, or ones that you have on the go at the moment that you're particularly excited about? Yeah, so one I'm really proud of because of its significance to us and our survival, I'll just talk about first. So as I mentioned before, Kyandra started in um, 1995 as a, biz- as, a, as a company and we've done quite a few things like Kyandra used to do sort of managed services and sort of full end-to-end IT as well as security services as well as in IT security, and we divested those aspects and really focused on just doing software development because even throughout our whole life, we've always been mostly known for software development, and so it was a natural thing for us to focus on. We really wanted to be great at one thing as opposed to being just good at lots of things, yeah. and so that's the decision we made. But what had happened is, we, you know, there was all sorts of things, as you would know, like we had like um, – the GFC and, uh, you know, and the dot-com bu- bubble bursting and then the GFC and these things, and they all had impacts on the business. But we got to a point in about 2017 where we really had hit a crisis stage. At that point, Kyandra was a um, a traditional custom software development company, and we still are, but we also do all the new cool stuff too, which I can talk about separately. But the point is back then that's all we did. And what is that? That is your traditional writing lines of code from the ground up uh, you know, in, in .NET, we were very much a sort of a Microsoft-based technologies company and we were writing .NET custom software. And in 2017, you had this massive drive by this stage is that um, clients were engaging companies who were very much based offshore. Um, all of the previous um, justifications as to why offshore didn't work no longer were true. Offshore did work. The communication batteries and things had largely been solved. Um, you could, you know, you had your big companies like your Deloitte's and et cetera, all had very successful offshore models and they were delivering software that much cheaper per hour. And really, we're in this environment where it was a race to the bottom as far as, uh, as far as price. Yep. And for us, we were in a crisis point. And so we, and we, and it really, hit this point for us too where we were losing projects and but we had this one project where we had implemented a solution uh, for language translation and, and interpreting and uh, we that the solution that we had built had been in place for uh, well, nearly a decade and we had we were ready to do a whole new transformation of that and rebuild it um, I mean excuse me having software uh, run as a software application that you build run for a decade is quite unusual. And this solution was certainly getting a bit um, long in the tooth. And so we'd been working with a client, planning this for almost a year. And then we were right to start. And then at the last minute, we found out the client said, look, we're not going to proceed with yourselves. We're going in a different direction. We're going to leverage low code. And uh, we were like shocked. And this was, um, you know, this, this, this was the last thing we needed at this point. And we're like, what do you mean low code? And they said, well, we're going to be using this technology called Out Systems, and um, we're uh, going to be going with this other other company to implement it. And they had put in a quote, as in this company with using Out Systems, had put in a quote that was roughly half our price, and roughly delivered in about a third of the time. And so we were like, "This is awful," but we need to get our head around what is this platform and. So, um, you know, we got our systems in and our systems um, uh, then demonstrated to us this use case where they, in 15 minutes, they built in real time for us a CRM, a basic CRM system from nothing. And so uh, they would be like, right, you'd have uh, leads and opportunities and you'd have, um, you know, you'd have accounts and, and they would just drag, drag, drop, drop, bang, 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 all done in real time from nothing, yeah. building this out. And we were just blown away. And, um, you know, and I, 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 I spoke to the tech team about it and they had said, look, we'd looked at this technology years ago, but it, they hadn't felt it was ready. But, we, you know, we then did a real significant assessment and we really had seen that as of that point, so from our perspective, 
um, we certainly could see that it was enterprise grade and you could build the same systems that we would otherwise have been building using sort of traditional methods, but much faster and overall much cheaper. Now, obviously, someone might say, well, hang on a minute, when you build software yourself from the ground up, you don't have this license cost. Well, that's true. But when you deliver a solution leveraging a platform in low code, such as our systems, well, then, yes, you have a license cost. And that sometimes can, you know, not be insignificant, but your services cost is way less. It's way less. So your overall cost is way less. And so anyway, so we, we, we've obviously lost this project. We've now learned about our systems. We became our systems partners. Now, we'd also recently around that time lost a pitch to uh, primacy underwriting management. Um, so they're, they're sort of, uh, I think there would be Australia's leading crop insurer. That, um, yep. And they, uh, and we had done, we had pitched our typical solution. So they had a large transformation activity they wanted to undertake and we pitched it in .NET, but we were too expensive. We we're going to take far too long. And so we were like, right, hang on a minute. And we contacted them and they we said, would you be interested or prepared to allow us pitch again using a different approach? And they graciously said yes, and we did. And we pitched that together with our systems because we were fairly new to the platform at that stage. And then we won. We won this digital transformation yeah. with Primacy. Mm-hmm. And for them, um, you know, what we were at, what we were able to do with with our systems is that for for, for Primacy, we for them it was around um, in their market, a competitor might go to market with a particular product, and they would typically, if they moved heaven and earth, they would uh, perhaps get to a point where they could. Um, release a competing product maybe in a month. Now, that month is a, is a very uh, stressful high exposure period. What we did is we were able to build a fully dynamic and flexible product generator that could respond and create their own version of a product in response to something in the market in within hours. Yeah, wow. So you've gone from a month to deploying new products to the market ready for purchase by um, you know, brokers slash customers within, within hours in, you know, instead of weeks. So, um, you know, and that kind of massive automation is, 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 is the kind of projects that make the biggest difference. And then the other one, you know, then it had, you know, other aspects like, you know, automating approvals, um, very granular um, uh, testing and system to make sure there weren't any mistakes or issues with claims or um, with claim calculations, because errors in claim in, in, in claim calculations had a massive could have a massive impact, as you can imagine. And so, you know, rollover processing was sixteen times faster with this system, and we actually facilitated thirteen times more business in the first year of going live wow. with the new system than it had before. Now, um, there was nothing inherently wrong with their previous system. It was just that modern platforms now can make such a massive difference. And they had, they just, and they, and I really have to hand it to Primacy because they had the courage to to engage and do such a project leveraging this technology. And I believe they were certainly amongst the first in Australia. Now, many companies have done it internationally, but Australia is a bit of a um, a laggard as far as uh, uh, you know taking on new technical initiatives. Yeah. They like to, you know, and um, it was uh, it, it was. Uh, it was your yeah, hats off to them and it was a great success. The other thing too is that the way we work and what we did with them and we do this with the clients is unless they specifically don't want to, we fully enable their internal team as part of the implementation so that at the when we've implemented the solution, they're not dependent on on us. That's yeah, a critical okay. thing that we yeah. do. And the thing is loco platforms are easier to use in a lot of ways than traditional software development. So you can train people of of different backgrounds, obviously devs take to it really easily, but then we've had great success training, for example, business analysts and other people to be great developers too. So what that meant is that now Primacy are making all the changes themselves, and you know we um and and they don't need us anymore to uh, to to take their system and run with it. So and that's really important too. And a lot of the time, that also would be a reason why these organisations wouldn't have the courage to take on a project like this because of the state that they'll be left in and the dependence that they would have, which in itself is risk um, after you would even do that project. So that's another key thing too. So 
I'm really proud about that because of it was the spark of the really the where we we hit our straps, yeah. Yeah. and um and and that's taken us to then do awesome projects of significance. We're doing you know loan origination systems and really financial services has really embraced that low code approach, which has been wonderful. The other one I just want to mention, I think that I'm really proud of is back in 2009, we actually built a platform for note taking that starts that 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 was used by physiotherapists to do clinical notation. And back then, you know, iPads and things, I don't they I don't think they if they existed, they were brand new. I yeah. can't remember when the iPad started, but it was really radical to use a sort of a do digital have a digital pen and to write notes and things at that time. Now, fast forward to today, and that product originally was Enotfile, but it's now actually morphed into a product that's um, called Noted, so N-O-T-U-D, uh, that, um, and, and Noted is a, is, is a you know, successful company in its own right, um, and uh, it's actually really been used by financial planners. So what, and I think it was an unexpected direction uh, yeah. of it, and it was driven, I think, a fair bit too by one of the shareholders of Noted is a financial planner. And so yeah. I think, I think um, his needs have really driven that. But, you know, fundamentally, um, from what, you know, the, the way it's described to me, you know, financial planners, they, they, they're they using Noted to take notes during client meetings, information sessions, professional development activities. They can, you know, directly file those handwritten notes against the client contacts, say in Zero Practice Manager or in their personal PD folders. But a lot of time too, they're creating sort of, you know, financial structure diagrams and illustrations mm. to explain concepts to clients and staff, not just handwriting. And they, the platform allows them to share that instantly. And then all of that gets automatically filed with the client's records and um, eliminates any need for scanning or retyping. And, you know, and then the whole lot is audited, right? So, you know, as it requires these file notes for every client, it receives financial yeah. advice. So having a secure backup and audit trail is critical. What's been really cool with that too is that AI has fitted really nicely into that because it can then interpret the um, all the handwritten notes, interpret the diagrams, and with this, um, you know, GPT four O, uh, mm-hmm. that looks even more cool as to what we can do with that. So, um, yeah, so I, I'm really proud that you know, um, Noda could start as something for, for for clinical notation in the medical field, then move right into for financial planning, and really how that platform has developed over time so um you know uh, I, I will if anyone wants to take a look you know not, noted's not kyandra so they're separate companies so uh but just i'm really proud of what they've done with that so if you go to noted n-o-t-u-d dot com slash financial planners no spaces or one word have a look uh but uh, that's something also i'm really proud and excited about where that's gone yeah no that's that's amazing we'll put the the link to that in the show notes, I think just picking up on in particular your first example, like it was so clear that that business, that you had understood what that business needed. They wanted to work with you, but it was just, I guess, came down to, you know, the cost and the the speed of delivery as well as maybe um, the increased risk of, of tech debt becoming a thing. And the other thing that's really clear too is, You've actually transformed yourselves, which I assume makes it really easy or a lot easier to then go through that process with other businesses or your your clients because you've been through that process yourself and you've reinvented yourself and changed the way you do things. Have you got any sort of comments on that? Yeah, so it's been really interesting. So you, you're so right. So Low Code has not only did it transform the business, we we had to learn some some hard lessons uh along the way around its implementation because loco could be really fast, but humans still have to do human things like yeah. agree on what the requirements are, agree on um, – and, and the key thing is making decisions at the right pace. So if you can imagine if you were doing in, in the past at sort of a transformational project in an organization and just say you earmark that you would do it over two years in the past and you'd have a, you know a few releases – we used to call them, I think, milestones back in the day. So, you know, there'd be phase one or milestone one and phase two, milestone two, and these releases would all have subsets of features and things. You know, you might start with your MVP and go from there. You would work at a certain pace and the organizations would, um, you know, would 
largely be okay to keep up with making the decisions as they're required. But what we have found is that if you're using a tool that allows you to develop twice as fast, up to 10 times as fast, depending on the context, because you can drag and drop um, and it builds out so much of it for you, you then have to really get a rigorous, structured, high-speed yeah. decision-making framework put in place. And that really is around you know, deputizing people at different levels of what decisions they can make, what can't they make, providing the information at the right time in advance. Otherwise, you have this process where work sort of stop, start, stop, start, stop, start, and then that drags it out. So really understanding how to how to manage and put in place and help clients with decision-making frameworks to align with the transformational activity was a learning that we found um, because going into the project, we didn't realize to what extent that would be an impact. And now we've done it enough that we really understand how to put it in place so it's not too difficult. But yeah, that was certainly a big learning. And uh and 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 yeah, balancing the human aspects at the at, you know at the right time with the right pace. The other thing is that um, the, the the a lot of the time too, even if say the human element means that your original project may not be as delivered as fast as it possibly could be. Um, yeah. I.e., there's a difference between say you got a couple of devs who know completely in their heads exactly what they need to build, then they can smash it out so fast using low code. Alternatively, you're doing a solution that requires 10 different stakeholders to be involved, that inherently will take a bit longer, even if the low-code platform is not holding you back. It's still way faster than traditional development, but the real, real benefit is that once you've implemented the solution, the, the time and cost of pivot, as in yeah. it's inevitable that something will happen in your market or you'll have an idea or a customer will need something or you'll have an opportunity where a particular client wants this particular integration and you need to implement it fast. And the time it takes to implement those changes, that's where the speed we see ourselves is 10 times faster. And so when you're investing in in that platform for the long term, you really want to be thinking about not just how long does it take for me to get there at the start, but then how quickly can I make the inevitable changes? But I don't know what those changes are yet, but I want to be able to pivot um, and you mentioned before about tech debt, and sorry, there's one last part I really should yeah. mention, and that is that the cool thing about these platforms is is that they really insulate you so much from tech debt because you've essentially configured them how you want them to work, and then they they update and improve themselves over time with updates and things. But your application, you don't have to do anything to facilitate that. It just it just it just updates itself, and that's a huge benefit because you normally you custom built something, it would then have all of these things that you would leverage that would say be no longer in service or no longer supported and then you'd have to refactor or rebuild these aspects yeah. and then eventually you've just got to just throw it out. And uh, you, you really are insulated from that so much now when you build the same custom solution but using a low-code platform. Oh, I'm with you. It's this is why I'm such a big fan of of tools like low code tools like Wakado, which we've which is sort of how we connected, and that was sort of my um, sort of debut episode. But it because they're always releasing new functionality, they're always ahead of the curve. Like you're really just standing on the shoulders of giants. And this is the case with like we're massive users of Salesforce as well. Like I use Salesforce Flow, which is um, yeah a visual canvas of either screens or or back end automation. So you know, record triggered automation or scheduled automation where they do releases what, like three or four times a year in terms of Salesforce with big new things that I can just jump in the day it's in our org and start to use those features. Like you actually, um, you can enhance the way you do things really quickly. And with tools like Wakato as well, you can really easily sub out. Like if you're integrating with other tools, like for example, we use Stripe to process all of our payments if something better comes along, I can quickly jump into Wakado and sub that out for the next best thing. Like it means you just don't get left behind or the risk of getting left behind is is far less than if you went at it alone. Yeah, no, you're so right. And look, for us, obviously, yeah, we do, we, we, we're Wakado partners as well. Um, and uh, and I think for us from a low-code aspect is because well, Wakado is low-code and yes, our systems too. For us, we've really gravitated because of our custom software development history. We gravitate towards tools that give us, you know, the the most extensive custom canvas 
that we could uh, imagine. And, and so for us, that's why we've chosen our systems because it gives us really that kind of you can do anything in a business context. There, there, there is we, we feel it's got the least limitation and the most scope for anything you can imagine because they're the kinds of projects that we that we yeah. do and that's why we chose the tools. But your points that you made about Salesforce things, yes, spot on. And it's such an exciting transformation. It kind of makes sense because software originally used to just be lines of code without even a graphical user interface. Yes. And then, you know, yeah. when people started using Windows 3.1 uh, or the or Mac, and obviously I think I may have angered a lot of people because they'd say you should have said <laughs> Mac first. Yes, that's true. But the point is um, people were blown away, the concept of an icon. Um, and I think, you know, and, and that graphical way is of, of interacting with a computer, well, this now, this approach through low code is now, you know, the, the, the modern way of, of making software do what you want it to do. And where it's going next is conversationally interacting with these tools to have them yeah. build your software for you. So let's see if I wouldn't be surprised if in two or three years, you know, we'll be having a conversation or at least everyone will be having a conversation about the, about the software that they build that the AI, um, creates for them. And, uh, you know, I hope, I, you know, and we will have obviously needed to have adapted and be, um, great uh, users of that but, and great um, consultants of that. But uh, I can certainly yeah. see where that's going to go in the, in the future. Yeah, I'm with you. And, yeah, just on that point around the visual nature of those low-code tools, like it feels like it's the closest thing to something tangible. Like you can really sort of sit back and go, wow, I've built that. Like see it come to life really quickly, which is really great. I mean, like before you get to that point, so deciding on the platform that's going to be used, whether it's, you know, OutSystems or Wakato or something like the Microsoft Power Platform, are you looking for like existing solutions? Um, you know, does the engagement start as more of a consulting arrangement, like unpack their stack and then work with that business on the air as they want to transform? Like what's your what's your process there? Yeah, so the first thing we do is we do like a um, a fully facilitated mini discovery to kick it off yep. and that and that is to essentially ascertain from from a more sort of block level what are the key goals of the organization and yes to to a certain extent and absolutely if we see areas where it really doesn't make sense to custom build it then we will put our hand up absolutely but a lot of the time our clients uh, know their industries really well and have um, have usually drawn the conclusion themselves that either there isn't something off the shelf that they uh, that'll meet their needs or they really really want to be different so they deliberately want to make sure that they create a customer experience for their clients that is um, very different to to anyone else and so usually our clients have made that decision first because a lot of the time we won't necessarily be across, every single different um, software yeah. as a service offering or third-party product. And so we're careful not to provide that. However, yes, if it's obvious to us, like nowadays, even though I use that anecdotally sort of 15-minute CRM example, you would never build yeah. your own CRM <laughs> really. Like it would be crazy. But the, So therefore, if that happens, a client says that, we strongly recommend they go in a different direction. But um, but yeah, otherwise, aside from that, you know, there are plenty of um, obviously uh, – products that they'll be better across than us because our you know that's our job where we, we, we create custom software um, we don't try and be experts across all the third-party products but yeah so so but what we then do after we've done that discovery is we what's really critical for us is to is to build ag- agree on and build a proof of concept um, or a working prototype is the is, is, is a better way of describing it of a subset of what they want to do. And we ourselves do that at no cost. Yeah. And we do that to show that we're not full of BS. Really, a lot of the time, this can sound too good to be true. Yeah. And and so it demonstrates to the client that, one, we understand your requirements. It allows us to show and bring people, our people into the room who perhaps have some working experience working in that area. So when you're delivered... Um, you know, lots of of loan origination systems and insurance underwriting platforms, et cetera, et cetera. You you know, your team gain a fair bit of um or a degree, should I say, of financial services sort of understanding. And that 
goes a long way when you're talking to a new insurance client about what they want to do. You 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 can get to the point really fast, and you're not having to teach us fundamentals. So that really helps, and then, so it allows us to show that we understand and we're the right partner. So we'll build for you a small subset of what you do, and we'll do it at our, at our own risk. And uh, so that's that's a core cool part of the process because before everyone has invested massively in what we call a deep discovery and then yeah. the build activity, you really want to make sure that everyone's on the same page. We don't ever want the project to fail. We don't ever want there to be a misalignment. So, yeah, we always build that proof of concept first and it gives the clients a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of confidence there too. And anything we build for them, um, we're very careful and it's their IP. So, you know, we're very conscious and obviously there's – Lots of NDAs and things are very conscious that often it's they want to differentiate, so their idea is very critical, and so um, yeah. you know we we're very respectful of that. Anyway, after that, if everyone's happy and we've built that prototype, um, then it falls into you know a, a paid engagement, and then there's like a, a deep discovery where you determine what you're going to build. We then fall typically into usually like an agile based process where we will build the solution in two week sprints. And then we will be we will showcase the work that we have done every two weeks to make sure there's alignment, and also to ensure that we're um, tracking to what we said we would deliver um, for each of those sprints. And then uh, you know, and then you go through this whole process where um, also the solution is tested in flight. So the spirit of it is you're meant to be building working software within yeah. that two week period every time. You test and validate that that is correct, the gone are the days of um, we'll just build it, we'll come back in six months and then we test the end. Um, so that what that then means is the very end you're doing what's called a stabilisation and that is really just making sure that everything then works end to end all together and it's like that final check. But the clients had the confidence of testing with you along the way for every, you know within each two-week sprint. And then for us, because of the power on, and the and the so much of the risk is taken out with these with these low-code platforms in particular. So, you know, scaling and security and performance and all those things are are taken care of for you, that it allows us to have the confidence to we provide a 24-month warranty at the end of our work. Yeah, wow. And we don't – clients don't have to, um, for example, sign up to a service agreement of X dollars and then they get the warranty. No, you get the warranty and you don't have to pay a single cent more to get that warranty. Now, that – we couldn't afford to do that, to be honest, if we were building software always the old way. Yeah. Um, but uh, with these new tools, the risk is eradicated so much for us and the way we work and the, with our methodology that that um, gives us uh, the ability to do that. And so if you think about it, really the whole spirit of it is around how can we demonstrate skin in the game? You demonstrate skin in the game by building a working prototype up front and you're not charging a client. And then at the you know for that you're proving that you're you know you put skin in the game you you know and then at the end of the project you then have further skin in the game by having a 24 month warranty so that's taken us 30 years to reach a yeah. point I think that we're capable of doing that well and uh, yeah I um it certainly would be tough I think to start a new software development company nowadays I think but um yeah, uh, yeah but uh, we we had plenty of lessons learned that's led us to the point that we could uh, we can do that. No, I, I love that. I think that's two pretty unheard of but incredible initiatives. Like the working prototype initiative is – it's just like as you, were, as you were saying, like it's – you've got to trust the process but there's always that hesitation of, you know, I feel like you've heard me, understood my requirements. The next step is show me. And the fact that you can do that without, um, I guess, that other business putting – more skin in the game or the the leverage being sort of outweighed. I think that's really incredible. And, yeah, that warranty um, guarantee or promise as well, that's that's a really um, interesting concept and, and unheard of. Do you, would you sort of attribute that to like you've got a 92% repeat, repeat business success rate? Like do you think that comes into it? Like what does it take to deliver great outcomes? Yeah, so uh... – Oh, I, absolutely. I mean, ultimately, irrespective of your warranty, the client's experience, not just, it, yeah, it's got to, it's the client's experience right from the beginning of, of, of engaging with you and you honoring your commitments and delivering on what you say. And then obviously combined with the outcome is what drives the 92% repeat business success rate. 
it's not just yeah. one thing. It's so many things because it's it's as much about a relationship between humans and partners in in achieving an outcome as it is you know in 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 the tech or or, or, or anything else. And uh, now, what was your other question? Sorry, I just want to make sure I answer it. I just wanted to really ask, like, what does it take to deliver great outcomes? If you're if you're getting that level of repeat business success rate, like, is it asking the right questions? Is it questioning the answer? Is it active listening? Like, what does it take? Yeah, no, I see what you mean. Yeah, oh, it's it's all of those. I mean, I think yeah. Um, what's what certainly helps is that um, we the more having an experienced team on either yeah. side uh, helps immensely. Uh, it's not critical, but it's just if velocity is is one of your key drivers, and it certainly helps a lot. So what we often do is when we um, if we're working with a client now that client may have done a whole lot of digital transformation initiatives, it may not necessarily be software dev, but just the implementation of automation, or they may have have done. Um, a technical upgrade of something, you know, or they've implemented uh, an off-the-shelf product. But either way, um, they've 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 been involved in a structured um uh, sort of project. Then that will help a lot. And even if so, if they haven't, then we the first thing we do is we take them through, say, agile training and 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 other related training. So this is how you be a product owner. This is how. Yeah. You know, this is how you can do user acceptance testing and how you perform that task. Um, likewise, if we're doing an implementation with these low code tools, a lot of the time our clients want to be self sufficient. So they'll have people in their team who actually want to learn how to use the tools themselves. And so we'll teach them at the start and have them deliver with us. So we'll bring them into the fold of our development team. Yeah, okay. Everything is yep. fully, you know, and that goes a long way too. Um, mm. And uh, as I was sort of mentioning before, then putting in place a decision-making framework to match the velocity in the, the work that you're doing is yep. critical as well so that you don't get stuck and stop, start, stop, start all the time. Um, I think it's also critical, as you said, um, you know, asking the right questions and, yeah, questioning the answer, of course. Like you're, you're not just someone – what our industry has in the past been notorious for is that someone will go in the room – the consultant will say, "Yeah, okay, tell me your requirements," and they just put a shopping list together. It yep. shouldn't be about that. It has. We have a we have a, a, a structured consultative process where we actually explore and challenge. And there's like it's like a journey without sounding like a cliche, but where you really analyze. And we've got lots of experience doing different things for different clients across lots of different contexts. And yes, you can bring ideas within the financial services industry. But there'll be stuff that we've done for the health department that actually made sense, obviously, in a different context for the solution we're doing um, for an insurance company. And there's so much you can bring in there. So it's critical for us to challenge and go, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? And it's really important for us to bring ideas in the mix. Because if you if you just order take and then it's left to the client, then you, yeah. you're undermining the outcome massively. Yeah. No, structure is key. And I, I really love how involved – the team members are in that process too. Like I think that makes a lot of sense and they really come on the journey with you. I, I watched a presentation you made, which is about, it was from about six years ago. It's still very relevant, by the way, where you talked about a concept being the five stages of stickiness. Do you mind sort of briefly touching on what that was back then and, and maybe how things have evolved since then? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so... The five stages of stickiness and it makes me cringe a bit when I think about, <laughs> <laughs> think about that. I thought I was being really, uh, really quirky, but um, yeah. So, firstly, if we think about what 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 did I mean by stickiness? Well, ultimately, you're wanting to attract a client base or customers, and you want them to stay as clients or customers. And so, that's what I'm referring to when I say stickiness. Now, yeah. six years ago. The concept of people self-serving information in relation to their engagement with your organization was fairly, well, wasn't particularly common. So yeah. back six years ago, you'd have a website. The websites were often a brochure for your business. And then you'd have a contact us form and things. But a lot, you'd be, a lot of the interaction with projects and how they're going 
and all the work you're doing and things, so much of it was done over the phone or in person, you know, or sending reports back and forth through email and things. And so really six years ago, the first thing we saw as making a critical difference was that people were starting to get really frustrated when they couldn't get the information they needed when they wanted it at any time, 24 hours around the clock. So the first thing, the first stage, the base fundamental was get a portal in place that pulls information from your various systems and allows your customers to just see the information they want to see, i.e., I've put my car in for servicing, uh, yeah. how is it progressing, what are the issues, or what, what, what at least is the status. Um, so, yeah, uh, that was the first stage. And then I spoke about, well, what's the next stage from that? And that really is that concept of, well, you've got this portal where customers can get the information they need, but why not have it with an element of two-way interactivity? So the customer might um, get updates, but then, for example, if you're doing an engineering project, then you might understand, okay, well, this is where my um, project's at, but then I need to provide some more information. I need to upload documents. And a lot of the time when you're interacting with a lot of government sites nowadays, they operate in this way. You know, it's two-way interactivity. You see the status of something. You have to upload a document, upload um, ID, upload this other information and things. And that that, that is that two-way interactivity so that business continues to flow. Um, and the first one, the stage one was around giving customers access when they need information. But stage two is also ensuring that the business can then request information at the right time too. So yep. meaning that you're not, it's it, you, you're really trying to remove that barrier so that your efficiency is an impact. And then the the third stage of stickiness was where okay you've got this portal and it's got two way interactivity, but then have something which is rich and really um, well. For example, uh, has has rich functionality that drives greater sales. So for example, uh, whenever you go on a site and you want to get a quote for insurance and then there's a whole quote builder and it takes you through a whole process and you provide information and ask you questions and you respond and then those responses take you down a different path and together collaboratively with the portal you reach an outcome at the end that you can then um, instantly buy. That's really that context aware interactivity and trade that you're driving and so that is – that that's probably the most common thing that you would see now. Um, mm. That was quite uh, quite rare six years ago, and then that's that's three of the five. Now, if we're talking about number four, um, it was really around. And this is where Ricardo can be great, yeah. But uh, but um, really putting in place direct business to business connectivity, yeah. So that, for example. If you're an organization and you sell a product, but you know that when you sell that product, you have to order yourself from a wholesaler or something, widget A, B, and C, automate the whole thing. So you have you have integration from your company to this other company, and so that whenever orders are facilitated, all of the the chain throughout your the the the, 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 the order process and the sort of the distribution chain is all automated so that that order triggers that order triggers that order, and therefore that once again is just driving growth and um and 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 massive efficiency gain. And there isn't a scenario where then you have to have you know administrative uh, people then go and manually order something. And so that was that 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 has driven. I mean, a, a massive example of that is is like Amazon. I mean, Amazon do this yeah. obviously um, brilliantly, and uh, you know, and people would scoff Amazon years ago, but look at them today. Um, but uh, and then the last one, um, which companies like you know REA, so real estate, the comms that you do really really well, and that is that you imagine that say for example you know if um you're you're an organisation and you know using a real estate example, say you provide real estate listings, but then imagine the best way to keep say real estate agents. Engaged and dependent on you as a, you know, for want of a better phrase or sticky. Imagine you created a platform for them so that they could do all of operating their businesses. So all of the things that they need to do, managing their staff, even payroll and things. And I'm not saying necessarily that REA do yeah. that, but this is just a hypothetical example. 
you create the fundamental software tools that allow these businesses to operate, and a lot of franchises work in this way too, as in modern ones, then they're utterly dependent if you know, and they're utterly sticky because if you've created a software tool to allow these real estate agents to fundamentally function, then the process of them moving away from you is so difficult. And so we now work with our clients and, you know, hypothesize, well, you know, you, if your customers are these organizations, what would it cost for you to build a platform to, to allow them to easily do A, B, and C yeah. so that they have that dependence on you? And at first it can seem kind of silly, but it actually drives such radical growth. And, um, yeah, so like companies like REA, I think have been brilliant at how they've done that. Um, but, uh, yeah, and that's the fifth one. So, um, and that's that core, that core dependence yeah. on the platforms that you've built for them. So the, so what's happened today is it's, it's essentially similar, but the features that you can incorporate are far more powerful. Yeah. And so like the example I said before, well, if we were looking at a fully and dynamic f- product generator that would bring a product to market, um, in hours instead of a month. Back five years ago, six years ago, I would have suggested that it would have been essentially impossible, certainly for anything even remotely approaching realistic budgets or timeframes to build such a thing. Whereas now, you know, you can build that engine within a few months and then, you know, you can have it to production. The, the thing is too that, um, when you, as I touched on before, when you ideate and have a change that you need to make that perhaps, you know, you're, it's not about your flexible product generator, but something else fundamentally different and you want to move quickly and, and, and implement that change um, to hang on to market share or there's, there's a new startup that's popped up and that threatens your area, you can implement a yeah. fundamental change to your software platform rapidly within months, whereas it would take a year or two, five, six years ago. So I think... The fundamental principles, I would say, still are there, but the 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 the, the scale and the uh, and the richness of what you can do now, not to mention the AI aspect, that's just massive. Yeah. But I think we've only just started. You know, is that's only just beginning. But um, yeah, you know, uh, I um, sorry, Martin, you go. No, I that that was it. I I think I was breathing in. <laughs> okay, so no good. No, I think. I think all of those stages still resonate really strongly with me. I would argue that uh, a lot of financial planning firms are probably still at stage one, so that read-only portal. Um, but I'm really, really intrigued by stage five, which is basically, you know, you become the business rails for your clients. Like it, it doesn't get any stickier than that. Yeah. Um, but no, a really insightful um, discussion. I really love that framework. Um, Martin, I've really enjoyed today's discussion. What's the the best way for someone to sort of progress that conversation with you? Well, um, if you pop to, I think the best thing is just pop to our website. So, Kyandra, so K I A N D R A dot com dot au, and uh, it all should be uh, hopefully just front and center there. So, um, and yeah, we uh, obviously. Um, uh, we be delighted to to um, engage with anyone, and as I said before, you know, it doesn't hurt to investigate and look at a, a you know a working prototype proof of concept just to test an idea. And not all projects yeah. proceed past that point. So if you're like, I don't know if this is going to work or not, just reach out. It's not like you're not you're not you're not being billed from day one. So because for Perfect. us, for example, yeah, that cost that even though that's a fairly high cost to sale. What the projects you do make such a difference that um, it's worth it. So, yeah. Perfect. Martin, thanks for your time. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the conversation today, Patrick.